So there will be two more and just, um, I the HDMI apparently does not work with Apple type computers. So either you have to bring your own cord or save it to a way that we can pull it up on that computer. Um, and so we'll have two more presentations on Wednesday. So we're gonna finally cover proteins. Um, so between the snow and everything else going on, uh, and, and I had put this quote there. I'd made this slideshow like three weeks ago because I was supposed to do this several weeks ago, but, um, and it's let nothing that can be treated by diet be treated by any other means, which I thought was a beautiful quote um, and something I was discussing with, and now I can't remember who, but how our, oh, it was yesterday with some people. Um, our healthcare system really is a disease care system now. And it was somebody who's worked at Kaiser for 27 years and just the change that she's seen that we've become completely about pharmaceuticals. You guys are all too young to have seen the change because you're under 25, but I've seen it. And especially the past 10 years, really, um, that we've really become, it's all about just give a drug and send people home. Anyway, um, and that's not the computer that this is on. So we're gonna talk about proteins. Um, and most of the time, I usually start by asking, when you think of proteins, the first thing, the two things that people think of, or they tell me, one is muscles, that if I say, hey, we're talking about proteins, what do you think of? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? And so it's either muscles, that's gonna make me strong, right? Uh, what's another thing that comes to mind? Well, it's usually steak, <laughs> um, right? So, uh, but proteins, they actually, so proteins have become this elated place like by everyone except me, um, which is interesting because my doctorate was working on proteins um, or a specific protein, but, but the word actually, it was the first, when it was, when it was um, isolated, they gave it the name protein because of the Greek word proteus, which means primary. Uh, and so this is, I forget how long ago, but when they gave it that name, they said it's of primary importance. And that pretty much set the stage um, that corporations have just kept going and perpetuated for us. Um, and it is, if you desiccated yourself and pulled out all your water, because we're mostly water, 50% uh, of your dry weight would be protein. Now, I don't know why we'd want to do that, but, um, and it is a polymer of amino acids. So we're going to talk about amino acids in a moment, because again, I'm a chemist. So I don't know how you can do this without looking at least at the molecules. Uh, and that number is a trillion. There's, I don't know who could count them, but basically there's a huge number. It's like in the Bible, they say 40 years or 40 days. It just meant a long time. So I think we say a trillion, it just means a lot. If we look at all the different species on the planet, there's a lot of them. The thing that's really interesting is we're not the most complicated. We don't have the most proteins. We're actually pretty simple. Uh, we're about at the level of a nematode, which is the worm that lives in the soil. Um, and so, because uh, there's a lot more to us than just our proteins, but we're so focused on protein and our muscles and everything. Uh, the thing about proteins is each has a unique shape and function. So kind of like you and I, uh, and they are not just muscles. So muscles are one function of proteins, but proteins, your hair is protein. It's actually keratin. Um, and that's why we can shape our hair into all these awesome shapes and stuff. And so like Elena and myself, we're actually lacking the enzyme that breaks the disulfide bond. So she and I have curls um, because of that. Uh, if you have feathers, I have mine tucked in today, but feathers are also keratin and uh, your horns, which I hide under my curls. So when I was, my mom had grown up on a farm and my uncles had cows. And so whenever they had a new calf, they named it after one of us. So I had a cow named Joyce. Joyce was actually extremely prolific, but Joyce had horns and so she was mean, but that's because she had a lot of calves and stuff. So she was like the most prolific. Um, whereas Joe and Frank, they only made it a couple months because males are pretty much useless except to be sold 
for slaughter. You only need one male bull, and but um, that's true anywhere around the world. Uh, your nails, so your nails, and that's how to have strong nails. So has to do with vitamins and eating healthy. Uh, but Yoda definitely has strong nails. And the blood is shown there because your red blood cells are about hemoglobin. And so hemoglobin is a huge protein uh, and it binds, it's actually four units, it's so big and it binds iron and that iron binds oxygen and delivers it everywhere. And so it transports. There's a lot of the other ones that are transporters like ferritin transports iron around uh, to places. Our, our immune system is protein. So that's the whole thing um, behind the RNA vaccines is RNA is the precursor for proteins. And so could we make the proteins or target the proteins that were in the virus. And then of course our muscles, um, our skin is collagen as are all the vessels, our blood vessels are collagen. And so this is apparently an image. This is really good how advertisements convince us that this is what's gonna happen to you. Uh, and I can't remember what this was an ad for. Uh, collagen water is completely a myth. Collagen water is not gonna make your skin look young and healthy. Um, most, um, the best thing to make your skin look healthy is to eat a lot of fruits. Uh, and this is also a reminder, this is, it's May. Uh, and so your first 33 day challenge, it is in this week's folder for you to type up when you're 33 days. And so I know a lot of you were doing fruits, like three pieces of fruit a day. Uh, and since it is May, we also, um, want to be getting ready for our next 33 days. So you guys had a challenge from last week, which was seven days of mindfulness. And again, if you for some reason didn't do the challenge because you took a whole week off for various reasons, then do it this week and you'll turn that part of the assignment in late. Um, and then you're also supposed to just find an article on mindful eating and health. It's and your microbiome. You just type in the words and you get a billion hits. Um, I, I actually couldn't believe how easy it was to find stuff on meditation and microbiome, on mindfulness and the microbiome. There's a little thing there. Um, or stay after and talk to me. Or come early on Wednesday and talk to me. But um, collagen is a protein and it makes, it's like a braid in your hair. Uh, it's three strands of protein that wind together really tightly and it gets oxidized really easily. So it loses electrons. We've talked about and vitamin C is what repairs it and keeps it tight. So if you don't eat um, fruits, your blood vessels start unwinding and you get scurvy. And so if you ever saw Pirates of the Caribbean, Johnny Depp did a really good imitation of scurvy. So they're losing their teeth. They get bleeding gums and stuff. I actually know two people present alive in this day and age who have scurvy. Um, I didn't know it was possible. It was somebody who had digestive issues and was convinced by Kaiser Health that she couldn't eat any fruit or vegetables, that her body wasn't digesting it. This is actually all over online. You can find it in the Mayo Clinic because somebody diagnosed my best friend with this, like a person, a person your guy's age and said that he couldn't handle fiber and he needs to just eat white bread. And that would make his digestive problems go away. And I just looked at it going, I'm out, I'm done. I can't do this. And then he's, he had just not read the article. And I'm like, for real, this is coming out of like the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, everywhere. So anyway, this gal ate only English muffins, white English muffins with jelly on it, which is gonna be filled with sugar. and. Five years later, she had scurvy and then COVID happened and everything else possible and, but is convinced. There's also gonna be then this whole mental issues going on where we convince ourselves, yes, I can't eat fruits and vegetables, but you need vitamin C, it keeps it healthy. And that is why your skin is gonna age. People who smoke the oxidative stress, so their skin ages much faster suddenly you hit 30 and you look like you're 60. Uh, and then another thing that proteins do, and again, every protein has a specific function, is some of our hormones are actually proteins. So insulin 
is actually a protein. Uh, and this is why, so digestion, we talked about uh, last week and the week before, I think it was last week, last Monday, and digestion happens in our stomach of proteins. So if you took insulin as a pill, it wouldn't make it past your stomach because it would get digested. Same with collagen water, as soon as it hits your stomach, it's no longer collagen. And so um, insulin is given as an injection. Um, that's why the people have to inject it so that it, it goes in. Insulin has a lot of side effects um, that we kind of hedge over. Anyway, so proteins are made of amino acids. It's like one of my new favorite jokes. Um, and it's an awesome joke because it actually shows an amino acid correctly because there's the amino group. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't ionize it. People have been in my class. That's what an amino acid looks like. So carbon, right? Everything's carbon hydrogen based. Our body needs the carbon. Carbon, these bonds have electrons and our body needs those electrons. And so um, if this is an acid group uh, and this is an amino group. And then this group just varies depending on which amino acid you're talking about. Um, See. Right. And so these guys are going to form bonds. You're going to get a whole bunch of them hooking up together and you form a polymer. So we saw that with sugars, that starch is actually a long polymer of sugars. Um, and so it's like people holding hands because uh, we can start doing that again. We can start greeting people in ways that we have not for two years. Uh, and so that's what proteins are. The thing that's different though, is proteins, once they make those chains, they fold into these elaborate structures. And I think I have the pictures on some of the next slides. Um, and so they're not these long stringy things that uh, starch is kind of. These are considered the 20 amino acid building blocks in our body. Um, and you can see like the part that's in black at the top, that's considered the backbone that they all have in common, that they all have this amino piece and they all have this acid part. And then the colored part is the piece that varies. Uh, and so like in my biochem class, we spend a lecture where we talk about these because that becomes important because that's gonna determine how they fold and that shape that they fold into is gonna determine what their function is and stuff. Um, and so that is what, we think of with proteins. Um, but while I have this picture up here, every amino acid, there's actually more than just these, um, but all these amino acids have a second role in our body as just an amino acid. Uh, and so histidine is the precursor for histamine. Uh, and so histamine, of course, we think of at this time of year, because a lot of people have allergy issues, uh, glutamate and aspartate and glycine and another one uh, are uh, actually neurotransmitters. Um, and they work really fast because they're simple molecules, but glutamate's an interesting one because uh, monosodium glutamate, MSG, you've all heard of MSG. And so uh, it has, these guys are ionic. And so with the sodium on there, it, it makes a taste, um, it gives you beyond a salty taste because it gives you the umami taste that is addictive and makes you eat more and more and more but it's a neurotransmitter. And these guys excite your nervous system. So they keep you alert. But um, like for me, if I have monosodium glutamate, I, it overexcites it and I get a headache. Um, and so I just avoid it. So all those Doritos and Cheetos and stuff that are like bright red colors, those are just filled with this. And kids are eating them like they should be. Um, and so it just makes me wonder why their brain chemistry is all whacked up because we're feeding them too much of this neurotransmitter that should be excitatory or should be um, there for when we need it, not all the time. Um, and actually, sorry, uh, some of the other ones. So tryptophan is the precursor for uh, serotonin and melatonin and Oh, I think it's tyrosine is the precursor. I can't believe I'm forgetting um, for epinephrine, for adrenaline, and dopamine, and 
all that good stuff. But I, I don't know why I'm getting that wrong right now. Um, this is glutamine is another one of the amino acids. And I mentioned it because uh, it is a lot of people take, I, I did for a short time take glutamine um, because I was having issues with muscle fatigue after going for bike rides um, or even just stopping at red lights and stuff. And sitting there and waiting and then when i'd start biking again my muscles would be like all seized up and stuff uh and some made suggested taking glutamine now with any supplement one of the things i would tell you uh you have to get it in the powder so it's 100 percent glutamine if you buy stuff in pills there's so many fillers and even buying it in the powder you have to read to make sure it's not filled with sawdust and stuff um i eventually got to the point where i didn't need it anymore um but as I mentioned, I'd had cancer like eight years ago and the body recovery from that and the mental part, um, a lot of it was um, mental and emotional things going through. But 60% of your muscle amino acids are actually this one amino acid. So even though we have those building blocks, every protein is made up of different ones. And so that is why that often we need more of it to help our muscles repair themselves. A lot of people who are into the bodybuilding will actually take glutamine or it's in their protein shakes, like an extra amount um, for that. And this is the part that's kind of weird is when you exercise, your muscles actually start digesting themselves um, and you feel fatigue and stuff. Um, and so your muscles actually break down to replenish the muscles that were used. It's kind of a weird system. Um, and, and your body does get eventually back into balance, but um, sometimes when we go through things, our body needs the help. Um, and, and so it is formed, it's not an essential amino acid. And so your body does repair itself. It's just, we, we have started putting our body through things that um, are not normal, right? That we have to go to the gym and, and be able to push certain amount of weights and stuff for, I'm not sure what balance. Um, and I get to this, but probably on Wednesday. Um, but I guess it was that uh, it helps to balance pH. So the pH of our blood is really important. And that's one of the things, and I'll get to on Wednesday, um, one of the big myths of the high protein diet that they overlook um, because there's no way to get around it. Uh, high protein diet acidifies your blood. There's no way to get around that problem. Um, and, um, and, and staying in a healthy range, if your blood dropped to a pH of seven, which a lot of you've heard the pH scale, seven we think of as neutral. If your body pH was seven, you would be in a coma or dead. Um, so our body pH has a really fine line, 7.2 to 7.4. Um, most Americans are here at 7.2 and 7.4. And again, it's the projector. Um, I have more slides later on. But one of the biggest things with glutamine, which was part of the other reason I was taking it, is I was having a lot of issues digestively because cancer, since it was um, cervical, it was in the area um, and my Chinese medical doctor said, when, when you have something happen in one area, everything in that area starts having issues. Um, but I've, I know uh, everybody's having issues with digestion just because our food is crap. Um, and it was getting my diet too more optimal, but um, people having digestive issues with the small intestines, it helps to protect the small intestines. And so, um, people with autoimmune, um, food allergies and things like that. Glutamine really helps. It helps, right? It's like this wonder thing. This was actually um, all from a paper a student wrote about glutamine um, and he didn't know what to do a topic on. I said, hey, why not do glutamine? And um, yeah, so I took his whole slideshow and condensed it down into one slide, but um, there is a dark side. Uh, right, so it stabilizes blood glucose, and there's the dark side finally. Cancer cells love it, and so uh, it is actually the preferred fuel of cancer cells, um, and which is interesting. So anything too much of a good thing. 
Homocysteine is another one. I actually mentioned it once before, which is when I was talking about cholesterol. So total cholesterol, again, is no longer considered something they look at for heart disease. Um, they do look at the ratio, and so high LDLs would not be a good thing. But homocysteine, um, I, I don't know how expensive this test would be, but homocysteine is actually a really good marker for heart disease. And the thing that's interesting about this, so cysteine is an amino acid and methionine is, and they're ones that have a sulfur group. And so they deliver sulfur to places that we need sulfur. Um, but one of the things that happens is this needs to be a loop and adenosine is made and different things like that and cysteine. Um, and so for this loop to work optimally, you need, B vitamins. And so when people are low in their B vitamins, homocysteine builds up because it can't be used. And so you get the methionine and it gets to this point and it's stuck. It can't go this way, it can't go this way because you're low in your B vitamins. Uh, and this is also a good point moment to point out, you guys, your next round of presentations are actually in like two weeks and it's a vitamin. And it seems like a short turnover because uh, I don't know what's happened with this class, that there's people are here randomly when they want to be, but for those of you who are here, uh, you'll be wanting to pick a vitamin, and so you are limited with um, vitamins, so if you have an idea, you can let me know today or Wednesday, um, and so next week, I will be starting on talking about vitamins and minerals, but this is one of the places. I, I find it very odd, like I'm given the topics I'm supposed to cover, and to me it seems very odd, um, but we're gonna do it. Because uh, when people think of nutrition, they think we're gonna analyze each of the vitamins, um, but really it's a whole picture of stuff. And this is where a lot of the B vitamins show up. And so people who are not eating whole food diet. Um, but homocysteine is heart disease. It damages the vessels. It, um, it just, the list goes on. You get free radicals, you get blood clots, you get high levels of carboxane, which causes more blood clots. Uh, you get high levels of lipoprotein A, which is what coats the arteries. So the blood gets clotted in there. You get higher levels of LDLs and triglycerides just from having high levels of homocysteine. And those will coat the blood vessels as well as create the clots. Uh, and then you get more calcium deposits, which is gonna harden the vessels so it can't get things moving through. And so it's just like every possible thing. And again, the number one cause is low in the B vitamins. Um, and that is why that our diet is high in methionine, um, not mine a lot of people's diet is high in methionine. And the source of methionine is animal-based food. Uh, so whether it's cheese or eggs or fish, and it doesn't mean you can't eat them. Uh, it means the amount that we eat is kind of crazy. Um, whereas plant-based foods are gonna be higher, um, are gonna be lower in methionine. And the other causes, uh, kidney disease, because your kidneys, they're not able to get rid of things, uh, being on insulin. And so insulin has a huge amount of side effects. Um, I'm going through this because my closest friend was put on insulin and it's really hard to find anything bad about it online, except that I keep telling them every day, I talk about how insulin has all these side effects. Uh, smoking cigarettes, uh, nitrous oxide, um, being male, um, but then postmenopause for women, uh, drinking coffee, alcohol, uh, and there is a very small genetic factor. You would know because everybody in your family would have heart attacks at 30. Um, and so it does happen. Um, yeah, this is actually one of the best indicators is high homocysteine. And again, for most people, it is very easy to treat by balancing our diet. Um, and right, um, which is most people's numbers are like in the 20s. Uh, and I have no idea how much a blood test would be. Oh, I'm sorry. That was just to say that, um, so functions of proteins, uh, 
there are so many things proteins do. So most people think of proteins as you're gonna make me have strong muscles and stuff. Well, that's not even mentioned on the slide. So, well, I guess it is there. It's like a little afterthought, but they are, as I already mentioned, your nails and stuff. And so this is showing the sequence of the protein and then it's folding into different elaborate shapes depending on what the function is. Um, they help to repair tissues. They help to transport things. They are the workers of our cells. So we have enzymes in every cell. Um, that's like one of the big functions. And each one has a unique function depending on what it needs to do. So an example of enzymes, what most people think of is in the digestive tract of enzymes repairing things. But um, I have this there because it's just such a fun word to say because it's said so many different ways. But the F8 is another function because normally I go through all the functions and spend time on them in my biochemistry class. But um, the other function of protein, the other function of muscles besides to move you around is their storage of energy for when you run out of carbohydrates. Um, and so Nobel Prize only six years ago. And I can't remember if it was in medicine or in chemistry, but it was for autophagy or autophagy, depending on who you talk to and what country they're fun from. Um, and he was from actually Japan. And so I don't remember how he says it, um, but basically it's how proteins are recycled, which is the part that is really cool about it. Um, and so that auto means self and like phagocytosis is eating. Uh, and so it's self-eating and it's how our bodies, how our cells, not our bodies, every cell in our body, it's how it recycles proteins. So this is not the lysosomes, which are the garbage men that get rid of all the garbage protein. This guy actually is going to figure out, and this was actually really fascinating research he did. Um, and it is, the next slide. So there was a Nobel Prize won way back in 1974 for somebody who um, was able to figure out what the lysosomes were doing. And so lysosomes are the garbage men, which uh, when you have old decrepit proteins you don't know, need, they get thrown out of the cells and the amino acids go back into the general circulation. These are the, they get broken down and we're gonna use them, the amino acids within the cell somehow. So either it's going to regenerate new proteins, it's going to be used for metabolism and energy, um, whatever process the cell is needing, which actually is really cool. Or it can be released out <coughs> um, for other cells around it. And so the other thing that's really cool <coughs> is um, there was a question, I can't remember if it was somebody in here or my other class, and I apologize. I have four classes this term, and it's really confusing my brain um, who asked me what in which class, but it was about, um, and it, it's the myth that is still being perpetuated. Our bodies heal themselves, and this is one of the things, this process. Um, they used to say if you had nerve damage, that was it nothing would happen. And now there's this buzzword called, it's been around for a while, called neuroplasticity, that our brain changes. You are not set. Unless you're set in your ways, none of us are set in our ways. Um, and it's being able to look at things from a different perspective. Um, that's one of the things with meditation, that if you're able to, in your meditation, to step out and look at something from another person. So you just had an argument with somebody, is to be able to sit down and look at it from their perspective which is really hard and very humbling to do and realize, wow, they may have misinterpreted what I was saying. And they're coming at this from, you know, they may have had a really hard day. They may have been hurt by a relationship in the past or something. But anyway, this is cleans up plaque. Um, if you're given it the right ways to help clean up, uh, whether it's in your arteries, there's been um, studies that have shown that uh, heart disease is completely reversible. And so this week, when you get to watch a video, and that's the one I recommend for most of you, not all of you, because there's four of you would 
had to have watched it in my other class. Um, it is, it's, it's a good video. It's from 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's not as good as their books, but um, these guys don't do heart surgery. They don't do surgeries to remove the plaque. They actually change the people's diets um, and they have shown scientifically now for it's over 50 years because the first studies were in the 70s um, that you can reverse it. So uh, Bill Clinton had heart disease, had like quadruple bypass, had stints put in and it all came back. I don't remember if he had bypass. I know he had the stints put in. I think he had at least some bypass. Uh, and he had best doctors in the world. Uh, and so then he went to Dr. Esselstyn and he changed his diet um, and became completely vegan. And so when Hillary was running for president, you may remember that Bill looked, the first time she ran, she didn't, she was like running for vice president. He didn't look so good because he was going through the American Heart Association following their recommendations. Um, but then I remember looking and I was like, wow, he looks amazing. What did he do different? Um, yeah, I saw, so I happened to walk out of my classroom. I teach one class on Zoom. And so my family's from Pittsburgh and it was right, the NFL draft apparently happened or is still happening. And I happened to walk out and Joe, Joey turned on the computer and Pittsburgh was making their draft picked. And Franco Harris, who was part of, the whole Pittsburgh Steelers, all the Pittsburgh Steelers, most of them died in their 40s or 50s from brain injury, from impact and stuff, from their hard training. Um, anyway, he looked amazing too. And I'm like, he's gotta be at least in his 70s, but he was just this big, strong guy. So I guess, cause he was a running back, he didn't get to the head on hits and stuff that the rest of them did. Um, but the um, big thing, this is the guy who won the Nobel prize. Um, is these are some of the things behind it. Um, so for treating cancers, neurodegenerative diseases, um, bacteria and viruses and stuff. And so how can you increase autophagy in your body? Um, well, naturally when you have high growth hormones, so when you're younger, your growth hormone is higher. Uh, so that's great. So you guys, your body's in optimal repair if you're feeding it and keeping it healthy and you naturally have regulated insulin. Oh, so again, I'm testing insulin. I didn't make these slides recently, but um, when we start injecting people with insulin to regulate their diabetes, we're throwing off this balance, um, just something to ponder. Uh, and so how can we increase it with other ways, right? That, okay, so I've hit a certain age, my growth hormone, how can I keep my growth hormone high and my insulin levels in check? Uh, and it is decreasing animal products um, in your diet and intermittent fasting because the first way is too extreme for everybody. Uh, and intermittent fasting I've talked about, so this is the idea and absolutely, um, and, and most of them when they talk about it, uh, and I tried to find this, and Stephen, if you wanna watch it as a video, for you instead of one of the other ones. I, I can't remember the guy's name who was like the premier guy in it. And um, he's down at USC or UCLA, he's from Italy. And I was trying to find one of his scientific talks because they're pretty sciencey, um, but about intermittent fasting. Cause he's, he's like considered the like top guy, uh, one of the top guys in the field, um, but it really is amazing. Um, and so it's the idea we're only supposed to eat in an eight hour window. And so when I grew up, that was probably true. And then 7-Elevens and Minute Marts and then McDonald's is just open all the time and everything's open all the time, 24 seven. And so you can eat all the time. And then we have all this stuff convincing you, you need to eat every two hours. You need to eat every two hours. And if you're eating every two hours, your body's just going to store, 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 and you're going to keep releasing insulin, releasing insulin, and that's going to suppress this whole thing. Um, and so the idea is you eat your breakfast, right, at whatever time, eight, seven, eight, nine. I mean, part of it is that we get up early and we're on the go, we're on the go, we're on the go. Um, most of these guys actually recommend 
and, and I'm not saying that I recommend this, is skipping breakfast. Um, for me, that was the easiest thing. Like I know Stephen did that. I know for my son, um, it takes a while. It's pushing the time you start eating back. Um, there is also though a lot of research where it shows breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And that's when you should have your biggest meal and you slow down as the day goes on. For me, where I am right now in my life, that strategy didn't work so well. So it worked better to move my first meal back to late morning. I mean, some days it is really not until noon that I'm busy, I'm, I'm doing stuff. Um, and so then you have your eight hour window. Um, or if you're really busy, but you could also be where if you're able to like monks and stuff, they would eat breakfast and then they would eat lunch and then you wouldn't eat again during the day. Um, now they're in meditation and they're living a very relaxed uh, lifestyle because of where they are spiritually and mentally. Um, the reason behind that though, is because historically, Monks had to go, right? They had their beggar bowls. So they would go out to the marketplace and people would give them food. And so meat historically was only chopped and prepared first thing in the morning. The butcher would be out. He would give everybody their meat. There was no refrigeration. You had to eat the meat by the noonday meal. You did not, it was no good by the time you got to dinner and you didn't eat leftovers. We didn't have a place to put leftovers. We didn't have microwave ovens. And so that is, where that probably came from is when people ate a big dinner, their food was already spoiled. So you probably started by eating a good breakfast and lunch and stuff. Um, and so consider that, even though there's, there's some studies um, both ways, but that's the idea of intermittent fasting. Most people um, say do the 16-8, uh, all the top athletes do intermittent fasting. And they say 16-8, they don't know what the optimum is. Um, but probably because it's manageable, but definitely at least a 12 hour window where you don't eat that after eight o'clock at night, you're like, I'm not going to eat. Now with that, Stephen made a confession to me because last week when I was talking about, I know somebody and she like makes her mom, you have to have my dinner ready as soon as I get home because I have to eat right then. He, he wrote a confession to me that he's like that person that um, he starts eating a little bit later, but he's at night if he hasn't eaten by a certain time um, and he drives his family crazy. And so um, he'll get over it. That's his thing. I did one one time. It was called the fast five. I don't know how it showed up. I was I was cooking and it came up on my YouTube list. Like they said, I need to listen to this guy. And he really you ate only five hours a day. And I talked about that. Um, but his was all because he was so busy and he just didn't eat until he got home. So they ate between five o'clock and 10 o'clock at night. Um, but the whole idea is during those hours that you're eating, insulin is being released and you're storing food, but then you have to have a time. Um, there's a lot of research going on. The 16-8 is something most people can eventually manage um, or at least the 14-10, but 16-8. I can't remember what Wolverine, how much he does. Um, there is the question if it should be only like a six hour window that you're eating in. But again, it's, it's hard to get enough food sometimes in that window, but it's something to play with. And again, you have to figure out your time range and that if it is a weekend, um, like this, the one guy, Jason Fong is another one who's a big guy on um, YouTube, who's a doctor who talks about this. And he says on the weekend, he eats breakfast because on the weekend he has small children and it's important to sit down and eat the meals together with the whole family. But during the week, he never eats breakfast. And, and I don't know. And, and so it's like, why? Like you can sit down and drink coffee or tea that has nothing in it or something like that. Anyway, so that's the idea behind intermittent fasting um, and or part of the idea. The other thing, which actually I don't know much about why this works, is a juice fast. Um, also seems to stimulate this. Um, that's not an option on there unless you wanted to. I've done a juice fast. This is where you're juicing. You're making your own juices and you're consuming them. Uh, you feel like crap while you're going through it. There's um, a documentary 
fat, sick, and nearly dead. It's hysterical. And this is Joe. Uh, is his name. So it's juicing with Joe is his rebooting with Joe. And he was overweight. He's from New Zealand or Australia. And he's really funny. And he was like a big like business person. He got a huge funding to do this. And he was way overweight. He was on steroids. He was on everything to try to control every possible disorder that he had. And so he decided he was going to juice for 40 days and try to lose weight. And, and he actually did. He got off all his medications, looked amazing. Um, and he also comments, like much later, if you go on his website, they should not have cut out in the documentary how crappy you feel while you're going through Juicy. They only have one little part, but I've only done like a week. I may have done a 10 day one once, but um, because you're, you're not doing the mechanical eating and stuff and your calories, but the idea is you're getting this plethora of nutrients and stuff. Um, and so it really cleanses your body, amazing. Um, but you become consumed with food. Like all you can think about is food and you go through detox, which you get terrible headaches. Um, your body goes through detox. You're going through pain as you're going through the detox. And so you have to be mentally prepared for that. And you can't wait until you go to sleep. You sleep, I slept amazing. Cause it was like, I can go to sleep now. I don't have to think about food. In your dreams, you can, you can eat food in your dreams, right? Um, Anyway, but it's, it's uh, to do a full water fast, you have to be um, somebody who is observing you and able to maintain that all of your blood levels are okay because some people, some things can happen. But I do know people who've done the full water fast. Um, so proteins, I already mentioned this. So we have where they make these long, these are huge chains. Uh, and then they fold into these elaborate pictures. And, oops, sorry. The very first, this is probably part of insulin's fame. The very first protein that was sequenced was actually insulin. Um, and sorry. Is yeah, that's, this is just showing you, this is a small protein. It's only 51 amino acids. And so that's just the amino acid chain, but then it folds into this beautiful 3D structure. Um, the largest one I think is a couple, is several thousand, um, but, oh, there we go. There's a picture of it. This is actually not the largest protein anymore. Um, myosin is one of the muscle ones. There is another protein in muscles called Titan. Um, that's even bigger and it does something that helps myosin and actin do their thing. But um, secondary structure, I kept this in here. Secondary structure is, uh, this guideline is Pauling, who is from Oregon. He's one of my heroes uh, and if whoever picks vitamin C, if you don't talk about them, um, I can't imagine how you can do vitamin C without talking about him. He, when he was pretty young, like 14 or somewhere in his teens, he was told he had a rare disease and he was told he wouldn't live to be like even 20. Uh, he lived into his nineties and he like realized uh, it is called, I can't believe I'm forgetting it now. Um, the word keeps coming and it keeps disappearing. Anyway, that we we all are like 99.999% the same, but we all have some uniqueness um, to us. And so Miranda can eat kiwis all day and night, but if like, you know, Elena eats kiwis all day and night, she's gonna, something's gonna happen and her mouth might break out or something like that. Like she can eat one kiwi or somebody else might be like Stephen was talking about, he's allergic to mangoes, the skin on the mangoes and stuff. And somebody else then said that I can eat too many mangoes and I can eat mangoes and fruit all day and night and have no issues at all. Um, orthomolecular medicine, that's what it's called. Uh, and so it's the idea that of optimizing your biochemistry um, with the nutrients you need. And so there's just some fine tuning and stuff. There is the whole school of nutrition at Oregon State University um, is called the Linus Pauling Institute. They were originally gonna make it in downtown Portland um, and then some deal happened. Uh, he was 
he was ignored. Uh, he won two Nobel Prizes. One was for structure of proteins. Uh, and this is back in the late 40s and 50s, so end of World War II. And then his second one was the Peace Prize for the anti nuclear testing marches. And then our government rewarded him by taking his passport away because they decided he was a communist if he was against nuclear testing. Um, but his big thing, what most people think of him as, is the vitamin C guy, uh, that he was really big into optimizing your health um, with vitamins. And I'm pretty sure in here I've mentioned like the secretary who was here when I was first here, she actually went to talks by Linus because she was asking me how much vitamin C I take, what I recommend. And she said, well, Linus told me I should be doing this amount. Um, yeah, anyway, um, but there is, and there is, like I said, I go across the street, uh, there's a naturopath and they do IV doses of antioxidants. And it's actually really fascinating to me for people um, that you need this shoot and you have to be sick if you and I got like if I got it I would end up with diarrhea because my body doesn't need that amount but my friend's going through a lot of oxidative stress uh, which is what the autoimmune diseases are and so it's repairing the body and it's it's quite fascinating um, to see it anyway so I mean zip through this um, and this, this actually is quite fascinating. So these are alpha helix, and then this is another type of structure where you can see the helixes are gone. This is the exact same protein, and something happens. These are in your brain. There are little, little protein peptides in your brain, and this is normal. And when this happens, this creates plaque in your brain, and you become senile. For all of you, because you're young, you pretty much get to mention die within a year. Uh, for me, I would just slowly decay over time and slowly lose my memory. And that has to do with how your brain is wired. It's somewhere around 25 that your brain chemistry, uh, they say crystallizes. I don't like that term, but I have a lot more brain connections than you guys have, but I have a lot fewer neurons. So you guys are still have lots of neurons and you're building neurons, but they don't have the connections. So if you suddenly have these guys blocking, you don't have enough connections to get around them. Whereas my brain knows how to make connections so it can figure out ways around it. Uh, this is mad cow's disease. And so it has to be some kind of factor that suddenly flips it. And so in mad cow, the cow had this, they're called prions. It's already won three Nobel prizes as they're trying to figure out what to do about it. Um, but as soon as you get exposed to one, it's not a virus, it's not a bacteria, it's a new form of disease. It flips all of them in your brain. And so kids, young people who eat a tainted hamburger, um, they'll suddenly, like their brain will just do mm. weird stuff. Aren't prions like cows eating cows? Isn't that like- isn't It's that so, like it's also stuff? humans eating humans. Yeah. It's brain, yeah. it's like eating brain eating tissue. Um, the problem is it somehow it's gotten into soil and stuff. So it's in like all different types of animals. Um, and if the person who's butchering, like if it's a hunter who doesn't know how to cut the elk correctly and they slice, I guess, the spinal cord, it can get into the meat or something like that. I don't know. I, I don't know enough about it. Um, other than snow, it is almost always going to come from some kind. Yeah. And that was, that actually was one of the things, because when this was like back in 2000, and I think was when it was like became this big deal. It was that what we feed the animals in the factory farms in this country, like no other country will take beef from our country, uh, that we were grinding up like the leftovers that we did put to sell in the grocery store and giving it back to the animals. So we were making them into cannibals, which was this cruel and unusual punishment. So that's why like Steven says, like he gets elk meat and moose or whatever caribou. You're a caribou? I had caribou once. And it was it was amazing because it's it's wow, this was 30 years ago. And then I got sick. I like, um, because I think energetically, it was like overpowered me. So they won't give me any more meat after that forever. Um, that was interesting. I was back. Um, there, there's like a very small 
genetic component. Um, and so you would know because your whole family would go crazy and die by the time they were 40. Uh, so your family you might think they go crazy, but when people say, I don't sleep, that's actually incorrect. You definitely sleep because if you lose the capacity to sleep, which happens with this apparently with the genetic disorder, uh, they literally can't sleep. They give them drugs. They like put them on stuff in the hospital and they lose the capacity to sleep uh, and they go crazy in a very short time and under a month and you're dead because if your brain doesn't get that time to turn off and do all of its stuff. Um, and it has to do with this. And, and so the thing was, is it's a family in Italy. I know I've read the story and I don't know if it shows up anywhere else, but they're like the most beautiful people in the world. And so that's why the gene keeps being passed on because they're like, this family goes crazy. You don't want to be anywhere near them. There should be. I want to be part of this family. They're going to go crazy. Your kids are going to go crazy. I don't care. They're so beautiful. For 10 years, I just get to stare at this beauty and walk hand in hand. And so anyway, it was a book. A student had given it to me on prions. This is like 20 years ago when it was, um, yeah. There's Linus, his second Nobel Prize that they took. And this is in the good old days when chemistry and you got to walk around with the models and stuff before computers and you had to build yours. Um, and he gives his wife a lot of credit for um, everything he did. And so there's prions that it changes from the um, normal, beautiful alpha helix and something happens uh, and it creates plaques. I must have the picture. So this is what we want our brain to look like. And this is with the prions. There's just these holes that don't look like big enough holes. And again, older people, because there's enough connections, can, can go around them. Um, and I should flip this picture. So this is healthy, which would be the purple. Uh, and then this is, this is specifically uh, would be cattle because it's bovine. Um, I know there's issues with elk in certain areas. I don't think it's in this area, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. I think it was Colorado had huge issues at one time. Because um, I had a student, and again, this is like 20 years ago when it was like all over the news. This is just the overall 3D look. We're gonna zoom through this um, and that they fold and they usually have an extra thing. And this is something, this is what happens with digestion. I wanna to get to the next part so I can talk about what your next challenge possibilities are is, is we have the protein is folded into these elaborate parts and they can have these spirals. They don't all have these spirals. They're just really fun to draw. Um, and denaturing is what happens in your stomach. So your stomach has churning happening as well as a low pH. And that change in pH, there's, there's connections, there's attractions that hold these together uh, and it gets jiggled apart. But if you notice the ribbon is still there and that's because that's held together by covalent bonds. They're actually stuck together. So I always give the example, it's like your shoulder, your arm by your shoulders attached to your body or your leg through your hip. And so that would be like a covalent bond. You can't take your arm off without a chainsaw. And so an enzyme would be a chainsaw. And so that would be the next step um, for the second part of digestion. But the first part of digestion is we have to unravel. And so this is the kitten trying to unravel, but it's not cutting apart. Um, and so to get down to the single amino acids, we have to do something called hydrolysis. And that word lysis just means that we're cutting them apart into single amino acids. We're losing the connections. And those are proteases because um, they're proteins or peptidases. And so you hear protease inhibitors. So with AIDS, um, which we thought was going to be untreatable, like everything, oh, there's nothing we can do. And of course, people now, um, they have treatments for AIDS or understanding why some people never get sick. Um, and so these are gonna be the scissors that cut it apart. And this is where it gets interesting because it doesn't cut one at a time. It's like Miranda has a pair of scissors and she can cut between alanines and methionines. And she just knows magnetically, boom, boom. And so she cuts here, here, here and passes it on to people behind her. And they have different scissors that can cut different places. And so by the time it gets to the back of the room, we have all single amino acids, but we've changed proteins. 
And when we change the sequence, so that's the kitten I was into mm -hmm. trying to, it, she can't, it's all bound up. And so this is not going to work. If I give Miranda just like a whole clump of stuff, it's gonna, her scissors aren't going to work at all. That you need that denaturing step, that previous step to unwind it. And that is why your stomach pH is low. And so a couple people and um, ask that question at the end of the notes, and I've, I've enjoyed that. They're like, what happens if the pH of your stomach isn't low enough, which is what we've done with these medications and stuff is it doesn't denature. And if it doesn't come apart, like on this one, the scissors aren't gonna be able to cut in all the places. And you're going to end up with protein, just you're not gonna get all the amino acids out of it. And you're gonna get parts of the protein that are gonna have to pass through because you can only absorb single amino acids. And that's gonna create bloating and things like that. Um, and so, the pH of your stomach is crucial, as well as the gurgling, as well as chewing, that starts the whole thing. So when we, I'm gonna add that one. Um, you know, most people, when you talk about protein, they're assuming beef, steak, chicken, and you guys are all too young. This was Wendy's uh, commercial, which is probably one of the most classic and why they don't go back. I don't know. I don't have a TV, so I don't know what commercials are, but it was these three older, beautiful women, um, would always be yelling into the phone. Like you can tell how old the commercial is because it has a beautiful Alpha Helix phone cord, um, and yelling into it, where is the beef? Like anybody from my generation knows that. And by the way, so Wendy is a real person. She's around my age and she was at Duke University, same time I was. Um, I was in the graduate school, so I don't, I never saw her, but her dad gave a huge amount of money to Duke. And so the whole business school is named after him. I can't remember his name anymore. But um, anyway, that was their commercial ad. Uh, and that is, because this is part of your challenge this week, these are called legumes. But I think before I get to that, um, now this is from these guys, Vegan Street. And now I don't agree with their thing, except to say that yes, there is a huge amount of protein and very good protein in vegetable sources. The thing you have to consider is 100 calories of beef is probably a couple bites of beef. 100 calories of broccoli is a lot of broccoli. I remember... Um, my naturopath told me how much broccoli she wanted me to eat every day. And I just looked at her as she's walking out the room, I'm like, oh, wait, 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 I got questions. I'm like, do you know what you just told me? How much broccoli to eat? I'm like, that's not physically possible. And then she looked at this piece of paper that she'd been giving to like all these patients. And like, suddenly a light bulb went off. And I'm like, there's no way. That's like all I'd be eating all day and night, like nonstop to eat. I can't even remember how much broccoli. I have to find this piece of paper. But 100 calories of broccoli would be quite a bit of broccoli. Um, however, you're getting tons of other nutrients, but you would get pretty gassy. Um, if you're nursing, by the way, that was one of the things I had to go for a year or two where, or actually several months. Um, so when babies... Um, their intestines are not fully developed yet. And so if mom is eating cabbages and broccoli during the time of the intestines going through all the stuff, um, baby becomes really cranky because they're absorbing all those wonderful gaseous molecules through the mother's milk. Um, and you figure it out pretty fast that you stay away from cruciferous for several months. Um, but anyway, this is just another one of your things saying, that it, it's when I became vegan the first time everyone was, and this is 30 years ago, where are you going to get your protein? And then there was one lady who asked me, well, why did you become vegan? And she gave me like 20 reasons you could become vegan. And I just stood there going, well, I just read Gandhi's autobiography and just decided to stop eating animals because of reasons in this book. I didn't say that. I was just like overwhelmed that there could be so many reasons um, to give up animal protein and stuff. Um, the thing that, you know, this is, this is somebody made the slide and it's fascinating. Um, these guys are filled with water. Um, that's actually a huge part of them. And they're also, because of the color, they're filled with so many phytonutrients and stuff. Um, there is a balance. You can't eat 
just broccoli, even though that is one of the diet fads that I talked about in the first week. Um, so what you guys are gonna try to do for seven days is eat legumes. Now, the unfortunate thing is whenever I tried to find a picture of legumes, before you're like, oh, there's no way I can do legumes, there are over 16,000 varieties of legumes. And what most people don't realize, and there's so many different shapes, sizes, colors, and textures. So it's not just black beans. Although if you like black beans, you can do simply opening a can of black beans and go with eating black beans on your salad. Make black bean brownies. I was gonna make that maybe today. Um, like me personally, I could do this every day, every meal. If you go south of the border, um, traditionally, every group, you ate every meal. Like when I was in Costa Rica, you stay in the real like ethnic hotels, not the high priced ones. There is at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there is a bowl of beans out. And I was in heaven. I was so thrilled. My favorite is the lentils. Um, and just to make a quick comment about lentils, most people when they think you're like, I don't like lentils because most of the lentils in this country are those brown ones. And I agree with you, those brown ones have no flavor at all. Um, so you can actually find these now everywhere um, where it used to be almost impossible to find them, but they're like a pinkish or orangish salmon color. Um, and they're, they're my favorite of anything. Uh, there's also the green split peas, which are like a lentil. Um, chickpeas or garbanza or whatever you want to call them. They're, they're just all shapes. That's just one cap group of legumes. Um, green beans are actually, I didn't realize this, green beans are a legume as is edamame, which is just so fun to say. Uh, the edamame, you can't eat the shells, but snow peas, so peas or snow peas and eat the pods. Um, green beans are special because they're one of the only ones where you can eat the pod um, as well as the seed inside, except if you grow your own beans, there is a there is that perfect place where you can get the bean starting to develop the seed as well as the green bean. But eventually, if the seed develops inside, it gets too, um, the pod gets too fibrous. It becomes completely fiber and stuff. But edamame, which also means soy. Um, so if you're somebody who doesn't have an objection to soy. Now with that, and it will be my slideshow on Wednesday, this does not mean that you're going and eating highly processed soy isolated protein, because that's where for anything, whether it's milk protein or soy protein, when you isolate it, this is eating as a whole food and you can find them canned like no problem or green beans or adame. And there's one more, um, oh, I thought I had the next one. Peanuts are actually, um, not a nut, they're actually a legume. Uh, they grow different from all the other, uh, they were named peanuts incorrect. Well, there's a reason, but they are actually more like a pea than a nut. And so peanut butter, but that does not mean skippy peanut butter because I think it was Rayol did an analysis and Amanda did an analysis of Jif and Skippy. Skippy's like got to be the worst thing out there. Those things are high fructose corn syrup. They've got like four different types of sugar in them, but you can get real peanut butter or peanuts. Um, and anyway, there should be something in there. So if like pinto beans cause you to have diarrhea, then don't eat pinto beans. Um, but there's got to be some kind. There is every single one of you, there is one of these that causes your body to go, whoa, uh, your microbiome is going to be so grateful. They absolutely thrive on legumes. Um, and yeah, this is like their preferred food. This and fruit um, actually like amplifies your microbiome and then it feeds you the B vitamins that you need. Um, there is something else and I don't have it on this slide. There's something called, they used to call it the lentil effect. And then they realized all the legumes do this. And so now they've renamed it the second meal effect. And if you eat legumes, it, these guys have so much fiber in them that they slow down your absorption of sugar four hours later. So if you eat these, let's say 
and then you have a snack four hours later, it actually slows down the digestion for that long. Um, and so that's why they call it a second meal effect. At the next meal, you're actually still getting the benefit. So I don't think it's even four hours, it might be even longer. Um, it was just first noted with lentils and they've now realized that all of these. They, they also traditionally, my mom will call them pulses. Um, I, I had never heard that except for my mom. You've heard that term used or no. Um, anyway, and so many people love edamame. Um, and you can just, you just steam it and then you pop them out. That's like the best snack you can have. So if you're needing a snack, you just steam some edamame and you can buy them already out of the shell and then make a quick stir fry or you get canned. So something with this, you can do them, you can find them frozen. I thought that was crazy when I found a bag of frozen, um, can't, I think it was black eyed beans. They're still in my freezer because I always forget they're there. I bought them because I was like, this is hysterical that you can buy them frozen. I wanted to try it. You can find it ground into flour. So there's um, like they do with almonds, they uh, chickpea flour, lentil flour. So in Nepal and India, they actually make their doses out of lentil flour. Um, so they're wheat free, free flours. Um, I've, I've done that. I've made pizza dough out of lentils um, and chickpeas. Um, I actually like it a heck of a lot better than cauliflower based pizza. That's a little funky texture and stuff. Um, it, it takes learning how to use it. You, you actually just soak them for a couple of hours and then you throw them in your food processor. I found that didn't work really well. I had to like soak them in hot water for a couple of hours because my food processor wasn't as good as theirs. Um, yeah, you can sprinkle them on salads. You make, um, use them in place of flour, black bean brownies. Google it. I was going to put it on the thing or make them for you. Um, they're my absolute favorite. Um, and, and you don't use then any grains. Um, the liquid off that, that was what I was going to say that um, it's really interesting. You have to be careful with canned goods because there's going to be a lot of salt in them, but you're usually going to not use the liquid. Uh, and then you can rinse them to get the extra salt. Organic ones have like less than a quarter of the salt of the regular ones. And they're only like 10 cents more a can. So I was in the store one time and they had the low salt, they had the regular, they had the low salt, and then they had the organic. And the, the organic was even half of what the low salt one was. And so I cannot figure out how that could be. Um, anyway, so you make a big pot of chili. This is the name of the family. Um, so leguminous. I don't know how to say that uh, Latin, but, and every, so when I was in Nepal, that was the picture I wanted to put in here. I remember now, uh, every village, when you walk through it, you would first walk through these fields of beans that were just growing up. And we would think of them, oh, it's green beans. Grow, I mean, and they were growing taller than me. Like people are happy to get their green beans as tall as them, right? Growing up the pole vines, these things, they were just huge. Um, and everywhere it was different and they never ate them as like the green beans. They would always let them go to the point where they could get the seeds from inside and everywhere you want, you had dal, which was not just lentils. Sometimes it was made with whatever the beans were that that village grew. And I absolutely thrive off of dal. So dal is traditionally is lentils, but it's spiced um, with the Nepali or Indian spices. And it's just learning how to cook them. Like I do mine from scratch um, and it's just learning. Lentils are nice because most people tolerate them and they cook fast. Mung beans cook, mung beans are amazing. Um, and you can find these all everywhere now. But um, if you're not into cooking from scratch, like I'll, I'll on Sunday cook a bag of beans um, and then that will be enough for three or four meals for the week um, in soups or something like that. But um, yeah, all major cultures. This is the staple, the poor person's food. So my, remember my aunt Annie was talking about during the depression and the war, they were poor. 
they couldn't afford meat. So this is part of the whole thing with our fascination with meat, that it shows you're prosperous, especially certain cultures. When you come to this country, you suddenly are prosperous enough that you can have meat every meal, every day, huge hunks of meat. My son went into the Mexican store with our neighbor and he could he came home and he was in shell shock and he's like I have to tell you what just happened and he's just like it was just because there's just meat there's huge chunks of meat everywhere um but anyway my aunt Annie would say you know we had and it's considered like it's high price at the Italian restaurants now and I again the words are slipping my mind but basically it's pasta with beans um I can't remember the Italian name now um but it's yeah and so you're just sprinkling on whatever you want and everybody has a favorite one um and yeah um and what is that called when they make that red paste um so somebody made them for me and that's all that's in there is the rice flour and then the red paste from the zuki beans um there's no sweetener or anything and they're like the most amazing Things they do it at the tofu store with the moon beans. Do you know what what is it called? Muchi or something like that? Is that what that is? Uh, there's a lot of dishes that have red beans in them. Yeah, but they don't actually. Traditionally, they didn't use sugar. Here, it's hard to know because it can be talking about cheese. Um, because here a lot of the ones you find in the Asian pastry shops they add a lot of sugar because they didn't like 10 years ago and then they found, yeah, the sweet tooth happened. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, white beans, but whatever you want. You can make um, a really healthy artichoke dip with instead of using huge amounts of cream and cheeses in place of cream, you use white beans. You just open a can of white beans you can save a little bit of the liquid, but uh, in a food processor, or you just smash it with um, like sweet potato smasher and use that in place of it. So I made an artichoke spinach dip and that was my replacement for all the unhealthy stuff in there. And it was for kids and everybody and their parents were just eating up going, this is the best artichoke dip I've ever had. And I'm like, so they're going, it doesn't have all the crap that you people all eat all the time. And then spices. Um, definitely going to want to use spices. All right. Uh, and so that's, again, this is one of the unfortunate things when you get these, there's the green peas, uh, which are so easy. I love mung beans. Um, this is right. They provide so many different nutrients, blah, 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 blah. We'll get to that. And then of course, everything has a dark side and you can find so much about the dark side of legumes and all these doctors who will say they're doctors and dress up in white lab coats and say that they're evil and that they're filled with anti-nutrients um, and they're gonna cause all these problems and stuff. Everything we can overanalyze for that. Um, my favorite is that they said that they're high in lectins. So lectins, a type of fiber that's actually really good for you. Um, and they're saying it blocks absorption of calcium. Uh, the number one thing that blocks calcium absorption is the pH of your stomach not being low enough. But, um, and that's part of why soaking the beans, if you're making it from scratch, uh, and then you pour out the water is that you're getting rid of some of these. Um, but um, and I already mentioned these, that these can cause some people to have bloating and stuff. Um, and that's part of why when they're cooked, you don't have the same issues and the tannins, which are gonna be high, but anyway, everything can find the darkest side um, and the oxalates uh, that, again, you can go and, and they will, the Cleveland Clinic will give you a thing or the Mayo Clinic and say, you can't eat anything except highly processed white bread. And I guarantee you'll get scurvy and be in misery and stuff. Um, get past that. Oh, right. And these are, this is another thing that said, these are, and it's great, the name of the website, ingrediologist. Uh, that these guys are your worst foods that you can eat. And so um, we can ponder who is sponsoring their website, which is a whole nother 
conundrum, which is the amount of money the meat and dairy industry has and that they are pretty much in control of our agriculture is quite impressive. This was the one that really got to me on the anti-nutrients was that all of these, we're gonna do a whole week on spices because that's your last topic, that they're actually saying black pepper is their first anti-nutrient there. Black pepper might be the best thing in your pantry for you. Black pepper apparently makes everything and, and the amount of black pepper you would have to use. They're saying cumin and curry, um, parsley. Parsley is like a superfood in turmeric. These are all you're using the spices in small amounts. And so they're telling you what to. Turmeric, by the way, is called this poor man saffron. It's just funny there because they're telling you swap it out for saffron and to get really good saffron, you would have to be a millionaire because saffron is like the priciest they think of it all. But um, anyway, one of the things you get to say no to this week and you get a choice. Uh, and some of you might have already said no to gluten. So you're like, well, this half of it's easy. So you're gonna eat legumes. And if you're somebody who eats bread, you're not gonna do gluten bread for a week. Um, and you can decide to do it for the whole month and you will find that, wow, I really was gluten intolerant because you all are. Uh, they changed wheat about 20 years ago. And when they changed it, gluten is actually a protein, not a carbohydrate. It is actually protein, so it's gluten and glycinin. Uh, and so this is a picture of it. And uh, we wanted wheat no longer grows like as high up to here. And you could walk through the wheat fields and see the wheat. Wheat now grows to your knees. And it's not that I was a little kid and so the wheat looked much higher and stuff. I remember driving across the country with Joey eight years ago and going through the Midwest. And I'm like, what's wrong with all the wheat fields? And I suddenly realized, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the wheat fields don't grow high anymore because we wanted to harvest twice a year. So we modified wheat. So it only needed to grow knee high and it would make the little kernel that is whatever these called that we need to thresh. We also, it made it so they didn't have to do the whole threshing thing to get the wheat kernel out of there. Um, and that changed the protein. So they no longer grew as high and what makes you grow, right? Would be protein. And so the gluten and glycinin changed its structure uh, and our body doesn't digest it. So remember I got talked about the enzymes, the cut. And so the sequence of amino acids is different and the plant doesn't grow as tall and your body doesn't digest it. So you end up with a bunch of dye and tripeptides and they sit there and they cause all of us to have intestinal distress. You're not gonna notice unless you stop actually for a full month and then you eat it and you're like, whoa. Some people actually know that they can't eat it because they were hunched over um, in pain. My neighbor's daughter, actually all of you guys, because you grew up on much crappier food than me. She was walking home from the bus stop, which is like from here to the door. And she stopped in front of my mom's house and she was just hunched over in pain and could barely make it home. And it's that she was full blown celiac. Um, and so nobody in the family had ever been celiac, but because we've modified food, we're creating everyone, the amount of celiacs is just like exploded and um, that we've created genes to actually change because um, that's actually a genetic thing. Um, but anyway, for me, some of it was digestive um, and the other one though was mostly, um, mentally emotional. Um, and so uh, I talked about it. Serotonin, most of your serotonin receptors are in your small intestine. This stuff is mucking up your whole small intestine. It's mucking up your microbiome. It doesn't know what's going on. Um, and it's in everything. And the gluten-free products often are just as bad because they're highly processed, but you really can get by without eating bread. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, that really makes people angry. Some people make them angry. For me, it might be the feminine part. It, it was, it did. I had, um, it was more sadness. And it was talking to a really good friend um, who's mom and she's just always joyful. And she told me she'd stopped doing gluten. Her sister is actually celiacs. Um, 
And so she stopped and got tested and she didn't have celiac, but she said she suddenly had more joy. Like for me, if I eat gluten, I go into two and it's two weeks it takes to clear it out of your, your, your um, system. Um, I go into darkness. And I've read enough papers from every single student and students talking about their sadness and this and that. And it's, but it takes, it takes more than a week, but it's, it is, it's amazing. Um, and I'm like, I don't want to go there. I can sometimes have a little bit like this kid in my kid's class on Friday. He saved the last cookie for me, he made cookies for his other class. And he's like, I saved one for you. And he was so excited. And I'm like, I'm not going to be able to eat it. And he's like, oh. He walked away and I stood there and I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> and like, you know what? I'll have half of it. And he's like, really? And he was so excited. And so I took a bite in front of him. And then I started talking. And I put the rest in my pocket. And like when he wasn't there, I threw it out. But I was, you know, I was like, he he made it for me. I'm not gonna say no. Um, there it's actually really easy because there's so much like Bob's Red Mill has a whole series of gluten-free um pre premixed. Um, stuff, but um, anyway, gluten. Oh yeah, that's another one. So every person, it's like, it's almost like an Achilles heel. It's so different. It can be skin issues. Um, well, we made bread. And oh, did you? And you couldn't? Yeah, and the same thing happened to Justine. We were, it was like one o'clock. We're like, what is going on? Yeah, insomnia is an interesting, so it's, it's hard. And sometimes you don't know until after you're like, you're like, I didn't really notice anything. And then you have some, you're like, whoa, did I always, and sometimes the other thing about all this, this is often happening more. It's not in your stomach. It's not the beginning. It's further down. And so it can be two to three days after you had the gluten before the symptom shows up. And for me, the one time, the last time I went into a deep, dark place, I got to eat, um, our whole yoga class went over um, and he was in his 80s, close to 90. Uh, and he had cooked for all of us. It was somebody's father. And he like did the slow cooker overnight. It was before the whole overnight oats thing became a thing, but it was overnight barley and something. And it was really good. And I had two bowls, I remember. Uh, and it was the barley. Barley has gluten. Cause I was like convinced it was completely the wheat thing. And I, and it wasn't, and it took me like a week into the darkness to go, what did I eat? Like it wasn't that day or the next day. It was like two or three days later. And it was enough that I couldn't like say it was, I ate this today. And you suddenly have diarrhea, right? When you get food poisoning and suddenly I'm like, oh my gosh, it was the barley. Um, and so I avoid barley more than anything, which is crazy because barley, nobody eats barley. It's not modified, but um, it was enough that the wheat and other stuff that had been going on that my, and it's not, it's not worth it. Um, I don't think it affects me as much emotionally. I found a, an original, I can eat the original wheat, which is called acorn, E-I-K-H-O-R-N. So in Europe, that's what somebody had asked, they said, when I go to Europe, I have no problem eating the wheat products there. Um, so they're using the original wheat Canada. Um, and, and so I found different ones and there was one and it definitely caused me to have um, some symptoms. They weren't the emotional ones, but it must have had something about the sequence of the amino acids. Um, but anyway, it's made into small peptides. And this is the other thing about it is it's an exorphin, which means it's going to act the same as morphine on your body, which is why people don't want to give up wheat. Um, so we have endorphins in our body and they bind to the opioid receptor. So the whole opioid thing, gluten is an opioid. We have modified it. It's an opioid. It's why you're like, there's no way I'm going to give it up. And it changes our perception of pain. And so we eat more because it's an opioid, people have opioid addictions. Um, and if you're gonna have wheat, like get the real thing, but or make it yourself and learn how to make, for one week you can go without. But in the 50s, men, like their waistline was 32 inches. And now the average male waist is 42 inches. And I think it actually went up with COVID, it's probably 46 or 52, uh, cause that's a 2010, um, yeah.
women's waist I, I, is possibly a different thing because women, the waist before was because they would actually wear stuff to keep it in. I actually knew a gal and her waist was like a 22. And it, there's also for women, because there's a by, um, right, our physiology. So some people are going to have a much smaller waist because of the shape. But anyway, those numbers are old numbers. And uh, in 30 years, and again, this is an old slide. This is almost a 2000% increase. Craft food merged with somebody. There's like, they're huge conglomerates now. Um, and so, as I mentioned, it's an addiction and you actually go through withdrawal. It changes your intestine permeability. Uh, and so it creates an autoimmune disorder for some people. Not everyone, but like um, Stephen was saying, he had insomnia, I had sadness. And a friend of mine also had sadness. And this is a quote from, the book's called Wheat Belly, Belly uh, which is where I got a lot of this. But basically, it's doing to you what cholera does, um, which is why some people will get diarrhea. Um, anyway, you don't become diabetic from blueberries, salmon, garlic, asparagus. Um, so yeah, and that's not my meme, but somebody else's that it basically does the same thing as heroin, which is why people don't want to give it up. So the opiate receptor is just perfect morphine, heroin, gluten, and I'm going fast to get to my last slide because the other choice you have, um, the other big one, if you don't want to give up wheat, is cheese. So the cheese is also an opioid. And I'll talk about that on Wednesday, but um, cheese has is really high in casein. So you didn't do all dairy and give up all dairy. You can be like, hey, I'm gonna go meatless May. Um, I have some people in my other class who are like, I'm gonna try it. I've always wanted to, you have to be in a place. And I'm not saying, hey, you have to do that, but it might be dairy um, or cheese. So cheese or gluten. And some of you are in a place where you already don't do gluten. So you're like, I got that part taken care of. Um, and yeah, um, but this, this is fascinating because a friend of mine, their son is, had been a meth addict and he's not anymore and he has a good job and all that. Um, but he went and changed out. He doesn't do methadone. He got tired of going to the methadone clinics. That's a whole government, whole fiasco issue. And so Kaiser gave him a prescription. I said, oh, it's for naloxone. No, it wasn't. And he told me the name and I Googled it. And it's just like, somebody else's name for naloxone. But the thing that's really interesting about it, so the same thing we're giving to people who are addicted to opioids, heroin, I guess he was heroin, not meth, excuse me. Um, so for heroin addicts, we also are giving to people to help them lose weight because you it blocks the receptor just enough that you're not as hungry and actually a whole bunch of other things respond to it. Um, and like I said, so for all of us, because it's all these are connected. Um, and so your release of endorphins also affects your release of dopamine, the reward center. But so everybody is going to, which is going to be related to melatonin uh, and serotonin, which is coming from all of that. Um, anyway, there you go. A couple of you stole me your paper, you know who you are. Um, or today you're getting in your mindful week. And I apologize for not posting that. I'm going to stop my recording.